from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Five publicly traded US-based companies have market valuations over or just near a trillion dollars. As of October 29th, Apple and Microsoft topped the list, each with 2.5 trillion, followed by Alphabet at 2 trillion, Amazon at 1.7, and Facebook, now Meta, at just under a trillion, off from its high of 1.1 trillion prior to its recent troubles. These companies have reached extraordinary levels of success and power. What, if anything, could disrupt their market dominance? In his book, Seeing Digital, author David Michella made three key points that I want to call out. First, in the technology industry, disruptions are the norm. The waves of mainframes, minis, PCs, mobile, and the internet all saw new companies emerge and power structures that dwarfed previous eras of innovation. Is that dynamic changing? Second, every industry has a disruption scenario, not just the technology industry. And third, Silicon Valley broadly defined to include Seattle or at least Amazon has a dual disruption agenda. The first being horizontally disrupting the technology industry and the second as digital disruptors in virtually any industry. How relevant is that to the future power structure of the digital industry generally and Amazon specifically? Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we welcome in author, speaker, researcher, and thought leader, David Michella, to assess what could possibly disrupt today's trillionaire companies. And we're going to start with Amazon. Dave, good to see you, welcome. Thanks Dave, good to see you. Yeah, so Dave approached us about a month or so ago. He was working on these disruption scenarios and we agreed to make this a community research project where we're going to tap the knowledge of the Cube crowd and its adjacent communities. And to that end, we're initiating a community survey that asks folks to rate the likelihood of seven plus one disruption scenarios. So we have a slide here that sort of shows what that survey structure is going to look like. And so, as I say, there's seven plus another one, which is kind of an open-ended. And we're going to start with Amazon as the disruptee. So Dave, You've been writing about the technology industry for decades and digital disruption and China and automation and hundreds of other topics. What prompted you to start this project? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. You know, as you said, the, the whole history of our business has been you know, every decade or so, you have a, a new set of leaders, IBM, digital, Microsoft, the internet companies, et cetera. But when I started looking at it, I was like, you know, that seems in, in some ways to have, have actually stopped that you know, uh, Microsoft is now 40 years old. Uh, Amazon is, what, 1995, it's getting towards 30. You know, Google's been a dominant company for, for 20 years. And, you know, Apple, of course, uh, and Facebook more recently. So, so whatever reason, this, this sort of longevity of these firms has been longer than we've seen in the past. So I sort of say, well, is there anything that's going to change that? So part of it, and we'll get into it, is what could happen to disrupt those big five. But then the sort of second question was, well, maybe the uh, disruptive energies of the of the tech business have moved elsewhere. They've moved to cryptocurrencies or they've moved to Tesla. And so you started to sort of broaden your sense of, of disruption. And when you talked about that dual disruption agenda, that whole ability of tech to disrupt other sectors, banking, healthcare, insurance, automobiles, whatever is sort of a second wave of, of disruption. So uh, we started just coming out, all right, what sort of scenarios are we really looking at over say for the 2020s? What might shake up the big five as we know them and how might disruption spread to sort of more uh, industry specific parts of the world? And that was really the, the genesis of the project and really just my own thinking of, all right, what scenarios can I come up with and then reaching out to companies like yourselves to figure out, okay, how can we get more input on that? How can we crowdsource it? How can we get a sense of, of, of what the community thinks of all this? It's great, love it. And as you know, we're, we're very open to do that. So we're going to crowdsource this. We're going to open it up to virtually anyone and use a multiple channel. So let's go through some of the scenarios, all of them actually, and explain the reasoning behind their inclusion. The first one, the govern, uh, government mandated separation, divestment and or limits on Amazon's cloud computing, retail, media, credit card, and or in-house product groups. It probably no coincidence that this was the first one you chose, Dave, but why start here? 
Well, I think the government interest in doing something to uh, hit back at, at big tech is, is pretty clear and probably one of the few things that has bipartisan support uh, in, in Washington these days. And also uh, government intervention has always been an enormous part of the tech industry's history. The, the antitrust efforts against IBM and AT&T in particular, and more recently Microsoft, a, a smaller one, but it's, it's always been there. There's a vibe to do it now. And when you look at all the big ones, but particularly Amazon, you can see that potential divestments and, and breakups are, are sitting there right in front of you. The separation of retail and AWS, uh, perhaps breaking out credit card or music or media businesses, or, uh, these sorts of things are all on the surface, at least uh, relatively clean things to do. And I think when you look at the formation of an alphabet or a meta, those companies themselves are starting to see their own businesses as consisting of, of multiple firms. Yeah, so I just want to kind of drill into the cloud piece just to emphasize the importance of AWS in the context of Amazon. Amazon announced earnings Thursday night after the close. AWS is now a $64 billion revenue run rate company and they're growing at 39% year over year. That's actually an accelerated growth rate from Q3 2020 when the company was, grew at 29%. It's astounding to think about a company this size. Moreover, AWS accounted for more than actually, but 100% of Amazon's operating profit last quarter. So the AWS cloud is obviously crucial as a funding vehicle and ecosystem accelerant for Amazon. And I just wanted to share some data points, Dave, before we move on to these other scenarios. Yeah, and, and just uh, on that, uh, I think that is the fundamental point. It's, it's very easy to see AWS on its own uh, as a powerhouse, but I think, you know, if you figure how much freedom AWS money has given the retail business or the credit card business or the music businesses to launch themselves and, and to essentially make no money for very long periods of time. Uh, you see that, you know, if you're a Walmart trying to compete with Amazon as a retailer, well, that money from AWS is, is an awful big problem. And, and so when they look at separation, that's the sort of stuff people talk about. Right, so I just want to, I want to, put that into context just in, in, the, in terms of the, the cloud business. So this chart is, is one from our ETR surveys that isolates the four hyperscale cloud providers and adds in Oracle and, and IBM who both own public clouds, but don't, you know, don't have nearly the, the scale. We don't have Apple or Facebook, they have clouds as well. And we could talk about that in a moment, but the chart shows net score or spending momentum on the vertical axis and market share or pervasiveness in the survey on the horizontal axis. It's, it's really mentioned share, not dollar market share, but it's an indicator. And the red line is an indicator of ele elevated spending momentum. And you can see Azure and AWS, they're up and to the right. I mean, Amazon is 64 billion. You know, uh, uh, Azure will claim larger because they're including their application business, but just their, their, their IaaS business, obviously smaller than, than Amazon's. But you can see in the survey, the respondents define cloud. They include that SaaS business. So the, they both, impressively have this high spending momentum on the vertical axis, well above that 40% line, despite their size. Google obviously well behind those to the left and then Alibaba, which has a small sample in the ETR survey. It's, you know, it's not as prominent in China, but even though it's IaaS cloud business is larger than Google's by probably a couple billion dollars. Now the point is these four hyperscalers, and there really are only four in my view anyway, they have a presence that allows them to build new businesses and disrupt ecosystems and enact that dual disruption agenda should they choose to do so, at least in the case of Amazon, Oracle and IBM are not in a position to do that. It's not part of their agenda. They don't, they don't have that scale. But Dave, can you talk about your dual disruption scenario? Very clearly Amazon fits in there and I would think Alibaba as well, but what about Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Google? Yeah, I mean, you know, people often say, what's the biggest difference between Microsoft and Amazon from a, from a cloud point of view? And the answer is pretty clear that Microsoft goes out of its way to assure its customers that it really doesn't have any interest in competing directly about them. So you don't see Microsoft going into the retail business or the banking business or the healthcare business, all that seriously. In contrast, that's really what Amazon is, is all about is taking its capabilities to essentially any industry it likes. And, and therefore, as one is as great as the service that AWS provides, it's often being provided to people who Amazon is actually competing with it, at least 
some degree or another. And you know, that's a huge part of, of Microsoft's sales pitch. And it's certainly a potential vulnerability down the road. Uh, it's very hard in the end to be an essential supplier and a direct competitor at the same time. But so far they've managed to do that. Yeah, so we put together just another sort of aside here, this little thought experiment to see what AWS would look like as a separate entity. And so it's a chart that looks at a number of tech companies and lays out their revenue run rate, the growth rates, gross margin, probably should have done operating margin, might've been more relevant, but market cap and, and revenue multiple. Again, given the size of AWS at $64 billion run rate and accelerating growth trajectory, it's just, it's remarkable. And so we, we figured this out based on industry norms and today's valuations, it's not inconceivable that AWS could be, you know, in the trillionaire club or close to it. So based on that discussion we had earlier, Amazon and Amazon's dual disruption agenda being funded by and powered by AWS, as we just discussed, Dave. Yeah, and just keep in mind, nothing that you or I are saying are predictions or saying that anything is going to happen. They are possible scenarios of, of what might happen that seem to make a, some plausible sense. So that when Amazon is making the sort of profits that it's making at AWS, naturally that's going to attract other companies because there's margin to, to be had there. And, and similarly, you know, look at, uh, you look at Microsoft for all those years, the, the profits it made in Windows or in Office software allowed it to do all kinds of other things. And essentially that's what Amazon is doing today. But if a Google or a Microsoft could cut into those profits through some sort of aggressive pricing, and perhaps we'll talk about that, you know, that would have a lot of impact on Amazon as a whole. All right, so let's quickly go through the other disruption scenarios and, and maybe make some comments. The next one sort of major companies increasingly choose to do their own cloud computing and or sell their products directly for competitive costs, security or other reasons. So Dave, I saw this and look at a company like Walmart and others, no way they're going to run their business on AWS. Walmart, as we know, is building out its own cloud and maybe it doesn't have the size of a hyperscaler, but it's very large. It's got the technical chops and can most likely do it a lot cheaper than renting cloud space. What was your thinking in this scenario? Yeah, the, the broader thing here is essentially one of that computing paradigms have been proven to go in, in cycles. You know, a long time ago, people shared computers and called timeshare, and then people ran their own, and now they're sharing them again through the cloud. And who knows, it's possible that the cycle could shift again through some innovation. And, you know, a lot of companies today look at the bills they're getting for cloud or for various SaaS services, and some of them are pretty high. And, and a lot of them will look at it and say, hey, maybe we actually can do some of this stuff cheaper. So the scenario is that essentially that the, the cycle shifts once again, uh, and it makes more sense to do stuff in house. Again, that's not a prediction, but a, certainly something that's happened before and could plausibly happen again. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about that in the industry. Uh, Martin Casado and Sarah Wong wrote that piece about the, you know, the trillion dollar basically sucking sound. And basically saying the, the scenario was the, the, the premise rather was the, that, that SaaS companies, their cost of goods sold are increasingly going to be you know, chewed up by cloud costs. And then of course, Mark Andreessen says, every company is going to be a SaaS company. So as the SaaSification of business occurs, you know, that's something to consider. Okay, uh, next scenario is environmental policies raise costs, change packaging, delivery, recycling rules, and or consumer preferences. Can you comment, Dave, on your thinking on this scenario? Yeah, first I'll just back up a bit. We're used to thinking of you know, technology is the great disruptor and, and clearly that's still important, but there are now other forces out there. China, which we'll talk about uh, the environment, uh, various cultural forces. And, and here with the environment, you see all kinds of things that could change that, you know, if you look at Amazon and its model of very high levels of packaging, lots of uh, delivery vehicles and all the things it is doing, uh, are those necessarily the best environmentally and, and will there potentially be uh, various taxes, carbon metrics or things that might work against that model and tend to favor more traditional stores where people go to pick them up? That seems to be a, a plausible scenario. And I think everybody here knows that desire to do something in the, in the climate environmental spaces is pretty 
strong. Uh, and, you know, if you look at, you know, just sort of the side, the, the recycling industry itself has arguably been quite a failure in that much of what is so-called recycled is basically put in tankers and shipped to the third world, which no longer wants it. Uh, and so the backlog of packaging and, and concerns about packaging and uh, what to do with all that, you know, those those issues are, are rising and, and will be real. And I, I don't know whether Amazon has a good answer to that. They're, you know, they obviously are very aware of it. They're working very hard to do everything they can in that space, but their fundamental model of essentially packaging every good in, in its own little uh, box or envelope or whatever is arguably not the greenest way of, of doing business. Got it, uh, thank you. So, okay, so the next one is price and in, in, in slash trade wars with the US and or China cloud and e-commerce giants. So protectionism favors national players. So are we talking here about, for example, Google bombing prices or Alibaba or trade policy, making it difficult for Amazon to do business in certain parts of the world? Can you add some color on this one? It, yeah, all, all those things. And I would just start with, with China itself. Uh, you know, you could argue that COVID has been the biggest disruptor of the last couple of years, but if you look at the next five or eight, and you had a look at all these things, you'd probably say China, the size of the Chinese market, the power of, of its vendors, players like Alibaba, uh, clearly can rival Amazon in, in many different ways. Uh, you know, it's no secret that it'd be hard for Amazon to, they're not going to be a big success in China, uh, but you can see it in harder ways that, you know, imagine across Asia or other markets where Alibaba is strong and you're in today's sort of environment where there's scarce goods and you know, maybe certain products, well, maybe they go, Chinese made products go to Alibaba first. And if you want to buy that product, well, Amazon doesn't have it, but Alibaba has it. You know, those sort of scenarios, if you get into a, a sharp trade war with China or even if, if the current tensions continue, it's quite easy to see how that could uh, play some havoc with Amazon's supply chains. In many ways, the whole Amazon retail model is based on a steady flow of goods manufactured in China. Uh, and that clearly is not as stable as it was. Right, got it. Um, the next one actually caught my attention, and this is a big part of the reason why we want to survey the community to see how plausible folks think this is. And it's it's technology related scenario. So that would potentially disrupt AWS and by, fault, by default hit Amazon. So that's major computing innovations such as quantum, edge, machine to machine, would obsolete today's cloud architectures. Okay, so, so here, what, what's your thinking? Just as AWS changed the game in IT, some future innovations or new business models that we haven't conceived yet could disrupt the prevailing cloud computing model, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, we're, go back to where we started, that new technologies have always been the main disruptors. And here we're looking at some potentially very powerful uh, new technologies. You know, your guess is good as mine about what's going to happen with quantum, but it's clearly a very different way of computing, quite possibly led by other vendors, possibly even led by China, which would be, be a, a huge issue. You look at the cloud, well, cloud's not very good at sort of edge stuff or machine to a machine stuff or, or sort of near field things out, you know, cars on a highway talking to each other. Uh, you know, again, Amazon's totally aware of these things and, and they are working on it, but they have a huge investment in other ways of doing things. And historically that inertia, that need to protect existing bases of activity and, and practices has made it difficult for a lot of companies to adjust to new things. And so that could happen again. Uh, and there's certainly a plausible one, but you know, in all these cases so far, Amazon has been aware of it and is trying to do it but you can still see the scenario playing out. And in a truly disruptive technology, it's not always possible for the incumbent to, to, to effectively cope with it. Mm. <clears throat> okay, the next scenario speaks to, I think some of the work that you've done in, in automation and related areas. Software replaces centralized warehouses as delivery services are directly connected to suppliers and factories. So Dave, this is like cut out the middleman, right? Software and automation changes the nature of the Absolutely. retail Absolutely, I mean, it, you know, in a world of ubiquitous delivery services and product standardization metrics and products being built and shipped from all over the world. The concept of running them all through a centralized warehouse is at least at a minimum, uh, seems like something that might be a, 
obsolete and replaced. And, you know, you imagine if, if Google built a significant taxonomy of, of core products that could be traced directly to where they are either manufactured, supplied, or brought into the country from whatever company that tries to sell them and the delivery service connected directly to that. Uh, and, and so, you know, that model has always been out there. Uh, I think at various times people have looked at it. It, it hasn't happened so far. And I think it, Amazon itself is, is, is looking at this, particularly in, so, as it gets more into food, that the idea of shipping all fresh food to any sort of centralized warehouse is a pretty bad idea. Uh, and so, you know, that model of software essentially replacing giant automated warehouses uh, is out there and, and seems to me uh, likely. And I'll just say that, you know, Alibaba for the record doesn't really use that warehouse model. It uses a, a network of suppliers and, and does it that way. And, and there do seem to be uh, some efficiencies that would, would likely come with that. The next one was, is, was really interesting from a historian's perspective and it's the penultimate uh, scenario, and that's the proverbial self-inflicted wound. I mean, you and I certainly remember IBM's you know, fateful decision to outsource the microprocessor and operating system to Intel and, 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 um, and, and, and Microsoft, sorry, IBM's uh, decision to do that. Lotus, you might recall, <laughs> they refused to allow 123 to run on Windows back in the day. <laughs> um, Novell buying WordPerfect, uh, Jim Barksdale, uh, a lot of young people in the audience won't, of course, remember this, but Jim Barksdale poo-pooing uh, Microsoft's decision to bundle Internet Explorer into the operating system. All those were kind of self-inflicted or, or blind spots. So this one is complacency, arrogance, blindness, abuse of power, loss of trust, so much more than the examples I gave. Consumer and or employee backlash. You're seeing some of that at Facebook now. And I guess this is taking their eye off the customer ball, losing the day zero in Amazon's case forgetting that customer obsession formula, their working backwards culture. And I think this is a big reason why Andy Jassy was put in charge so this wouldn't happen. But we've seen time and time again, as the examples I just gave, blind spots have absolutely killed companies, haven't they, Dave? Yeah, absolutely, he listed many of the most famous, but perhaps my favorite of all was Ken Olson, yeah. the founder of Digital Equipment <laughs> Corporation, one of the great tech visionaries of his time who stated over and over again, why would anybody want a home computer? <laughs> uh, or Unix's and snake so, oil was his other beautiful yeah, one. <laughs> all of those things. Uh, and, and, and so there, there's the blindness. Uh, there's the you know, IBM who just came to the view that they, and AT&T both came to the view that they were invincible and nothing could ever crack their control of, of their customer base. So we've seen all that. I think uh, more recently, I think some of these things can actually go from the bottom up. I and mean, you know, what's happening to Facebook today? Well, they're being hurt by former employees speaking out. Uh, you know, this never really happened too much to, in the IBM and AT&T days, but people calling into question Amazon's work labor practices and, and such things is, is certainly a, a possible scenario. Uh, and the whole sort of, you know, in the end, you know, people talk about a cultural backlash against technology. I'm not sure I believe it will happen, but it, it certainly is possible that people will start to uh, rebel against these firms. You see it more likely with Facebook is fairly well along there. Uh, Amazon's still popular, but you know, in the end, and as you, I think you said, the, the core thing that companies routinely fail on is they lose their customer focus and they get caught up in other things, their financial numbers, their, their power inside, their position of their company, but they, they lose track of, of staying close to the customer need. And you know, Amazon has done a terrific job of staying close to the customers over the years. Uh, so if anyone you know, was maybe less vulnerable to that, they, they would be well along that, that line, but it, it can happen to anyone. And new management is often you know, one of the real tests. Uh, and there's many examples of that through history. When a new executive comes in, will they have that same focus, that same thing? Particularly, you know, as the first generation's employees get wealthy and retired and, and a new set of people come in, you know, you look at Microsoft, the new people who came in, well, they're not going to be multimillionaires. They, they, they may have missed the, the great runs. They're, they're there to work. And, and the culture of companies changes when, when you get to that state. You know, Amazon's not that there yet, but you can envision that coming soon enough. So, you know, cultural issues have, have always been a factor and 
it's hard to imagine they won't be some sort of factor going forward. Well, and it, you know, you talk about that the 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 su succession of, of founders and CEOs. I mean, that's what to me makes Microsoft so astounding because the, during the Balmer years, uh, <laughs> it was unclear that they were ever going to become relevant again. And, and, and so Nadella has done a masterful job. But of course, they had the margins from the PC software business that allowed them to buy that time. But look, but look at Intel and the troubles it's going through. Uh, and so many other examples of companies that just sort of said, all right, well, we're going to pack it in and either sell the company or, which is again, what I think makes think companies like Oracle and Dell, which you know, founder led CEOs, not CEO in the case of Oracle, but still running the business. Uh, so quite uh, uh, significant. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we've talked a lot about things in my heard answer, but you got to recognize how in many ways, how amazing they are. And, most tech companies, a lot of them anyways, have essentially been one trick ponies. I mean, Google still makes overwhelming amount of its money selling ads and the things it's tried to do in cars and healthcare and various things. It, it, you know, they, they've often struggled. You know, Apple still makes the core of its money around its, its cell phone platform. Amazon's one of the few that continually generates entirely new, huge businesses. And, and you have to give them a, an enormous amount of, of, of credit for that. You know, Microsoft uh, was, a, they, they failed repeatedly over and over again with internet stuff and phone stuff and all these things. And it, it really wasn't until, you know, Satya came in and really focused on their customers and their need for enterprise services that he, that he really got the company on the right track. So, you know, Amazon has always been good at listening to his customers and if they continue to do so, it, it bodes well, but you know, history says other stuff comes along. Okay, and the last scenario is, is open-ended. Dave included, uh, you know, what did we miss? Is there another scenario yeah. that we haven't put forth that you could feel could be disruptive to Amazon, right? I mean, you got to have the, at least, <laughs> what did we miss? Yeah, I mean, you know, these are things that me and you and I just sort of made up at the top of our head. These are things we see that, that might happen, but, you know, in your huge audience of people in this community every day, I'm sure there are other people out there who have thoughts of what might shake things up or even doing things that might shake things up already. Uh, and you know, one of the things you do through you guys is, is get this sort of material out there and, and see what ideas uh, surface. So hopefully people will uh, participate in this and we'll see what comes out of it. All right, so what happens from here is we're going to publish the, the link to the survey in this video description and in our posts. We ask you to take the survey, please tell your friends. We're going to publish the results as always we do in an open and, and free way. David and Michelle, thanks so much for putting your brain power on this and collaborating with us. I'm really excited to see the results and, 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 and run through the other giants with you uh, as well once we see what this survey says. Yeah, that, thanks David, great. And yeah, if we can make this one work, it'd be fun to do it for, for Google and Microsoft and Facebook and Apple and, and see where it all goes. Most thanks definitely. a lot. All right, okay, that's it for today. Remember, these episodes are all available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. ETR.plus is where all the cool survey data lives. They just dropped their October survey with some great findings, so do check that out. You can reach me on Twitter, at dvellante. He's at dmoschella, or comment on my LinkedIn post, or email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com. This is Dave Vellante for Dave Moschella. Thanks for watching theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Be well, and we'll see you next time.